Welcome to another episode. This is the happiness episode. I might go to, it might go two episodes, but we'll see. I'm going to see if I can put it in one. Very hard to do, but we'll try. What will we cover? We're going to cover three steps to get you there, three pursuits to get you there, and three hard negatives to get you there. What are they? Okay, here we go. three steps. Accept where you are in its totality. Worst case scenario. And I'm going to talk about this. Redirect your attention to the reality you want and know that you have a choice to co-create. Now this will bring us to the pursuit. What are we pursuing in happiness? We're pursuing enjoyment, which is not pleasure. And we'll talk about that difference. We're pursuing satisfaction and we're pursuing meaning of life. Ikigai. But in order to get all this, we need to first go through three negatives, hard negatives. Most of us can do it with two. And you know, I like nine, right? Nine's my number. So that's why it's three, three, three. All right. But there's a reason behind it also. So we need to have negative emotions. This is survival. This keeps us alive. Can't be all flowers, can't be all. We would die. We need that to balance it out. Our body needs it. Remember when we talked about the body, when we talked about our cells, when we talked about feeding times, when we talked about this perceived stress that we have to give our bodies, this, this thing that we have to do with our mind, with our bodies to stay healthy and with our emotions it's the same with pursuing happiness is the same we cannot be happy all the time it's impossible so we have to deal with negative emotions and they're good it's for our survival we also need to deal with negative experiences this is how we grow this is how we grow and some of us like my son what are we talking about need to hit rock bottom Hard, not once, not twice, but at least three times. So welcome to the episode of happiness. And remember to get happiness. We need to go through these nine steps. We need to really go. So let's start. Let's go through it. Okay, I've got some notes here because there's some stuff that we really, I really want to cover. I don't want to miss anything. When we look at accepting where you are in its totality, worst case scenario. Okay, we need to come clean with ourselves. The good, the bad, the ugly, come clean. Really accept, know where you are. If you don't have a starting point, you can't compass your way out of anything. I can give you a compass. We gotta know where you start. I can give you a map. We gotta know where am I? What's my location? This is the most important thing. So you need to accept where you are in its totality. Really accept it, take it. No judgment. This is where you are. This is where we start. Once you go through that process, you can start redirecting your attention. What is the reality I want? Now, a lot of people might say, I don't know. Where do, I, I don't know. I haven't thought about it that much. Or maybe you do know. If you don't know, to start getting a feel for this, ask yourself two questions. One, why am I alive? And really go to the core to answer this. Just keep asking the same question and get somewhere. Why am I alive? Second question, what am I willing to die for today? Go through it, keep doing it. And this all, both answers might change as you age, depending on what age you are, but go through and take it seriously. Really, take it seriously. This will trigger a deeper thinking about happiness. I'm going to leave it at, like, at there, there for now. I'll get back to it. Okay, so we talked about redirection. The choice to co-create is when we realize that we are co-creators in our destiny. 
we are not victims. We are co-creators. And so we get to paint this piece of art that is our life. And that's what we want to get. And so in that, we're pursuing enjoyment. And when we talk about enjoyment, I'm going to have to explain. Because it's not pleasure is a very basic feeling. We all have it. Um, it's in our limbic system, way deep into the brain. It's our rudimentary brain. It's the, the original small brain. It's where we basically have survival and prosperity. That's the pleasure center. This is also where drug problems, addiction, pornography, all this stuff kind of centers there, can center there, can, can really create havoc for us in our lives. So we really have to be able to move out of that. How do we move out of that from pleasure to enjoyment? That's when we include people, we create memories, and then it moves us into enjoyment. All right? And there's a good book. <clears throat> Harvard professor wrote together with Oprah Winfrey. It's a great book. I'm going to recommend it if you want to dive in and read more about this. Okay. That creates enjoyment. When we talk about satisfaction, satisfaction is really about doing the hard things. It's the struggle. It's the suffering. And it's accomplishing something. It's about deferring gratification. You know the story, that the research that they've done, on kids that were able to basically defer gratification by getting candy in front of them and saying, okay, if you don't eat the candy, when we get back in a certain amount of time, you'll get double the candy. And I'm translating it loosely. And so when the researchers came back, most of the kids ate the candy. There were a couple that didn't eat the candy that were holding were able to basically tell themselves that they would wait uh, for delayed gratification. These were the most successful kids. These grew up to be the most successful people. So this is one that we have to learn. So satisfaction is really about doing the hard things, doing the work and the accomplishment. And really when we look at this, we really have to look at the journey, not the end result. All right, and there's things we do that, okay, money, fame, these are on the way. They are not end results we're looking for. These can help or facilitate end results, but they're not the end result. So if you take these as the end result, money, fame, you're gonna fall into a dark, deep pit. They can facilitate what we're looking for and they're needed to facilitate. In what level? Whatever you wish. But keep your eye on the ball. And money and fame is not the ball. Okay. We're also going to get back to that a little bit. We're talking about deferring gratification. We're talking about the journey being way more important than the final destination. The final destination with everything we do. And we see it in research when people plan vacations and they're like, oh my God, the planning part is where they get the most dopamine release, is where they get the most excited, all right? During the vacation, they're actually not that excited anymore. It's the whole planning. It's the whole journey leading up to it. That's it. Once you have it, it's going to be a downer. So really learn to enjoy the road. Know, the road. know that there's going to be hard things you have to do. There's going to be suffering. There's going to be struggle. But enjoy it. It is a gift. It is your teacher. And I know, I talk easy about it. I'm Listen, I've been trying to do this my whole life. Okay? Still trying. But we're getting closer. All right? But this is not about me. This is about the story of my son, Kai. But before we get there, I want to go a little further. And know that our bodies, just like with weight loss, what we talked about, every cell in our body, when I talk about happiness and I talk about this thing about struggle, perceived struggle that we need to 
for longevity that we need to activate our le- longevity genes that is also so with happiness it's the same so we have to have that negative emotion negative experience for learning we have to do hard things just like working out just like our nutrition how we feed ourselves just like everything right so in this journey we have and i just talked about something i talked about the end result and they have a name for it it's actually a rival fallacy the rival fallacy that you think that once you arrive once you gained that thing you're looking for and let's go to the middle step money and fame which is a middle step it's not the end step okay it's a middle step it's a means to an end but let's say you think that's your end goal the rival fallacy basically it's gonna be a downer it's gonna drive you into depression you're you're just gonna it's such a downer when you get there so there has to be much more there has to be much more that's what we're going to talk about your body just like with happiness has a homeostasis it has a home it has a level where it's trying to always get you you'll go down you'll have times when you're more depressed and negative thoughts and then you'll go up where you're like oh my god this is the greatest time you know i bought this car or i got this gift or i met this girl or and you're like hi but you're gonna go back down because it's always trying to pull you back to the middle but you'll have this and so there's people that do this okay my son there's people that do this cheerleaders There's people that do this, okay, poets, artists, and then there's people that do this, Glenn, today, judges, surgeons, these, they're like right there by homeostasis, no big highs, no big lows, just keep it there, keep it steady, Freddie. These are a couple of different, how do you identify yourself? Where do you see yourself? It's also one of the things you need to know. Who am I? Where am I? When I get these high highs, am I going to go to a low? Or do I have to be careful about that? Do I have to watch out for that? One of the things that we know that really, in the end, when we look at the blue zones, when we look at people that live long, when we look at people that are happy, that have happy relationships, man, there's a couple of three key things. (laughs) I can't let my three. Family. Yes, family. As difficult as they are, as much as you want to choke them, as much as you want to freaking... Sometimes, family. You need to make it work. Deep friendships. Deep, meaningful friendships. Key. This is your tribe. We talked about it. Your tribe. Longevity nine. Go back to my longevity nine. I'll pull it up here all the markers and faith spirituality this is where you do meditation this is where silence the brain silence the body silence the brain to really get to source these three are extremely important extremely important without these three you're not going to get through the rest of the nine okay one of the things that is interesting is this and think about it On this part, in my podcast, we always talk about how to thrive, how to have the best health, how to become 90 year old athletes. And a lot of what I talk about has the science around fitness, vigorous fitness. And it's a new thing really, because when people get older, they shy away from that. Oh, walking is enough. No, you need resistance training. You need to be lifting heavy stuff. You need to be doing hard work you need to be doing hits you need to be doing your stuff you need to be doing as you get older because we're losing muscle mass we need to keep it if we want a long life we want a strong life we want a high quality of life we need to do these hard things vigorous fitness lowers this is a study actually lowers your unhappiness think about it lowers your unhappiness remember this 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 doesn't go as far down. Keeps it up. Amazing, isn't it? Meaning. Meaning of life. 
Ikigai. I have a whole episode on Ikigai. It's the Japanese way of bringing these four circles together and the center is where you need to be. That's your meaning of life. You need to think about these four circles. I'll put them up here. Go back to the episode of Ikigai, meaning, purpose, and you can see it. We have to have a coherence, a why. We have to have a purpose, a direction, and we have to matter. There is significance. I talk about this when you're in a tribe. People that live to 100 in the blue zones. The key things that they talked about, their social atmosphere. And what made them live? Why did they live? Why did they wake up every day? Because they mattered. They felt like they mattered. They were still connected to their community. They're connected to their friends, their family, whoever is down. And if they don't have that, they have a group, a base group of five that they're connected to. Strong connections. Every day you need to, we're going to show up for each other. We're going to be there for each other. This is your tribe. Some of us have more than one tribes. Fine, but you need your tribes. And so when you're looking at this is the ultimate part. Your ikigai is really what's going to pull you through everything. It's going to pull you through the bad, the ugly, everything. Because it's purpose. Doesn't mean you need to know your purpose now. It can mean you're looking for your purpose, but you need to be in the pursuit of it. You need to be exercising it. When we get started, there's a couple things we need to look. We need to really investigate, ask ourselves, for me, what is right and wrong? Like, write it down. What's right and wrong? I need to see my moral compass, really see it. Write it down, see it. What do I believe is right? What do I believe is wrong? It's kind of like Carl Jung exercise. I need you to do that. Contemplation. And it's because, and this is why I want you to do it before I get to contemplation. Because you need to know where your integrity lies. And you need to know that when you're out of integrity, you weaken yourself. So how do you know your in integrity? You need to know what your right and wrong is. You really need to look at that closely because if you're off base, you're going to be hurting yourself and you're going to be hurting this whole process. How do we know we're off base? We need to look at base. And base is what do I feel is without judgment? What do I feel is right? What do I feel is wrong? What do I strongly feel? And am I somehow violating that in my actions, in who I'm being? This is a big one. Oh man, I violated that crap tons of times throughout my life, trust me, and I paid for it. It's a big one, it's a big one, and you need to know where you stand, you can't be guessing. Contemplation, a time for mindfulness meditation, a time for focusing internal, listening to the voices, the real voices, not, not the mind trying to keep you in the I, trying to keep you in the ego, no, the voice inside the higher power so mindfulness and contemplation i can do it with prayer you can do it with mindfulness meditation there's different meditation techniques there's even self-hypnosis that you can do there's different techniques but you need to be doing something all the time you need to be having this time of contemplation the third thing is accumulating wisdom okay and this means Read some Stoic philosophies. Philosophers read, and I don't like reading as much. I hate saying that. I, I had to read a lot, and I have to read stuff, but I like watching it. So I watch like YouTube, or I watch films that have meaning, that can strengthen my wisdom, teach me wisdom. And really, here it's like higher thinking, higher thinking. And with everything you've learned, with everything you know, look for people that can take you to the next level in books, in a series, in talking heads, whatever, wherever you can find it, look for people in seminars. I used to go a lot to seminars where I would look for these speakers that can take me to the next level, teachers that can take me to the next level because the pursuit of wisdom needs to be continuous, always moving forward. There is so much to learn, so much to know. And so we get to the point 
the story of Kai. I got one more thing. One of the shortcuts to happiness, one of the shortcuts to feeling happy, to get, getting closer, is to focus less on yourself. Give it away. Focus on some, someone else. Focus on someone that needs it. This is the story about that. And how do I get happiness? Not from someone else's suffering, but from helping someone. From getting out of myself to facilitate. To facilitate is a bad word because I did that. And my son got in a lot of trouble because of that. Okay, so that's a bad word to use. Don't use it, but to really help, assist someone in need, someone that could use you. Get out of yourself. Help someone that's sick. And you need to do it with less empathy and more compassion. Why do I say that? Empathy is you feel the pain. You go in with them into their victimhood. It's very easy to get there. It doesn't help them. With compassion, if you do it with compassion, you're really making hard choices. You can make the hard choices. You can come together and say, okay, how do we get out of this? How do we move forward? And that requires hard choices. Less empathy, more compassion. The story about Kai, my son Kai. Man, where do I start? It's a story about my expectations. As a father, you have this thing. Your child is born. You feel like he's yours. Mistake number one. We all have the privilege of guiding these souls of being in their lives for a part of sharing their journey but it is their journey we don't own them but as parents we tend to do that because of the things we do i want my kid to be like me i want him to be better than me i want him to go to school i want him to get this degree i want him to get that degree i want him to be ambitious i want him to rock it and it's much because we want our offspring to do better than we did we want that to go forward, to move forward, to become bigger, to become better. It's natural. It's also dangerous. So it's about my own expectations and my own happiness. And my son, I've, God, I, I grew up in the 80s around a lot of drugs. There's cocaine flowing everywhere. Was, I never did it. I was in sports. I was focused. I tried it. I tried marijuana just to show that, okay, I tried it but it's bullshit, I don't care about it. It's gonna, it's gonna basically not help my performance with my career endeavors and my education. It's not gonna help me with my performance in sports, so it's out. That was a simple calculation for me. But we live in different times. We live in, we live in times of mass stimulation by media. We had TV from, what was it? TV went on at, at four or something or five and went off at 10. That was TV. It was like three channels. That was it. That was it. One TV for everyone. No cell phones. No, it was rotary. Hello, that kind of phone. You had to interact with people. It was a, a diff, completely different time. I look at my kids and the kids around and they're interacting media through their phone. They're sitting together finally, friends, and they're both on their phone. They're not communicating with each other. They're communicating with each other, with other people on their phone, sitting next to each other. Mind blowing. All right. We have overstimulation. Companies are selling our kids everything. Ideas are being bombarded at them at a rate that is unprecedented, even before they can discern what's right and wrong, what's real and isn't real. It's shifting everything. So my son, he's in LA. His mom and myself got divorced. And it's a, that was a, it's a bad time for any child. It's a tough one. And, oh God, I have my guilt feelings on that hugely, which I have to keep in check. I have to work through them myself because these this will hamper how I treat him. It will hamper me helping him because I'm dealing with guilt. I become empathic. My compassion goes down and I have a tendency not to do the hard stuff. I have the tendency to give gifts, to try to repay, to do something to try to repay. It's not the way. 
So my son was in LA and in short, he went to, after high school, went to the university. This brilliant kid, gifted, physically gifted, doesn't know anything with him. Skateboards, you know. Skateboarding got him into, and not all skateboard, because I skateboarded too. Skateboarding is great, but it was the bridge that got him into drugs in LA. Went to the University of Arizona, quit. I took him to Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Went to the Vue Free University there, top, quit. Quit twice. Went back to Texas, where he stayed in his room for a year. Hardly ever went out. And then did nine months in Turkey, where I got him. I brought him to Turkey and did nine months. So that's chronological. In that time, we have depression. We have drug abuse, both pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical, on black sites. And black sites, I didn't, I was, I didn't know about them. Black sites. I may have heard about him when it. My son, who's gifted with computers, is able to, and you don't have to be gifted to go to black sites. Goes to black sites and can order anything under the sun, anything delivered, no matter where he is. So, yeah. Yeah. My expectations. My horror as a parent. I was just like, oh my God. He truly went into depression. He went into anxiety, social anxiety, anoclophobia, agoraphobia, psychologists, psychologist. He knew exactly what to say. Get out of that one. Didn't help him. Psychiatrist knew what to say to get the drugs that he wanted to get. Bamboozled all of them. Like I said, smart kid. Those are the most dangerous. But he went heavy into depression, heavy, scary. I saw him get to thoughts, more than thoughts of suicide, more than twice. And for a parent that is just, it's the hardest thing you can go through. But those are the hard times. He hit rock bottom and rock bottom, as we know, in addiction and I worked with addicts in a previous life. They have a saying, two things will change you. The light in the sky, or the fire under your ass. And it's never the light in the sky. But when it's your child, all you want to do is facilitate the worst thing you can do. But it's your natural instinct to facilitate. Give him what he wants. And it's the worst thing you can do. But it's his journey. It is his journey. It is his journey. This is the hard. Okay, it's very hard. Fuck. But it's his heart. It's his journey. So how can I support this? Not facilitate. How can I get him through it? How can I have him feel that rock bottom? Because he needs to feel it. Three times. So here's Kai. Just hitting rock bottom third time. Goes on a binge in his room. Because at this point he's in Texas for a year. And in his room. Orders in. Never leaves. Drags him. His cousins dragged him out a couple times. Went to a concert and told he got paralyzed with social anxiety. Paralyzed. Paralyzed. Couldn't, couldn't do anything. Couldn't move. Flipped. Chronic depression. In the dark. Remember when I talked about our circadian rhythm? Sleeping during the day, up at night, gaming, interacting online. Circadian rhythm. Gone. Devastated. What do you think that does to the hormones your brain's producing? Dopamine, everything. It's devastating. Depression was at an all-time high. Anxiety at an all-time high. Couldn't leave. Couldn't even pick me up at the airport. He wouldn't even go to dinner with me. He wouldn't get out of the house, out of his room, to even go to a restaurant to get something to eat. Teeth were yellow. He had 30 cavities. His skin was horrible, his hair, he lost weight, he looked like a freaking crack addict behind his computer in a spiral that just wasn't pulling up. So he hit the rock bottom when he got catfished and he went on a binge, fell asleep on his arm and got a radial nerve palsy. That's where your whole arm goes limp, you can't use it, the nerve's dead. At that point, I offered him, like I always offered him, a 
come to me. Let's work on this together. He finally said yes. So I flew to Texas, picked him up, grabbed him as soon as I could, just whatever he could take with him. And we flew to Turkey, knowing well, full well, that in Turkey, drugs are not a thing he easily come by. He doesn't know the language. We're living in a community where I can really isolate him in that sense and hopefully keep him clean. Now, at this point, he was also on prescription pharmaceuticals. And he, in the past, he would self-prescribe from black sites, whatever, order whatever he wanted, from Xanax, opiates, everything. But this time, he had prescriptions from psychiatrists who were trying to treat him. That, yeah, it wasn't really working at all. They were just helping him, facilitating his addictive behavior. And so when he got here, he was terrified. He was terrified to leave it behind. I took a chance. I went cold turkey, which is not, this is what I did. It is not suggested. I'm not telling you do that. But I felt, I assessed the situation. It's different with everyone. I have some experience, not a lot of experience, but I have some experience in this field. And I felt that I knew him well enough that we could do this together and got him off of everything cold turkey, everything, pharmaceuticals, non-pharmaceuticals, you name it, everything. Started getting him into the light, started doing cold plunges, frozen cold plunges, yes, to basically reshock the system, get the nervous system going again. Started in the yard with training, just movements, basic movements. At this point, I took him to the orthopedist to look at the, uh, the palsy, radial nerve palsy. He couldn't, his hand was just flopping, couldn't use it. And the orthopedist basically told him, and this was where he hit rock bottom again. He went into that crisis. Orthopedist said, listen, if this doesn't get better, we're going to have to do a huge operation and try to remove some tendons and muscles and rebuild to see if we can get anything going in our arm. That freaked him out. So you never know what triggers someone. And he just wanted to go back. He wanted to go back to everything, to LA, to his everything. Give me my drugs, give me my, I just want to go back. Luckily, we're in Turkey, so it's not that easy. And so I had a chance to sit again with him, talk to him and said, listen, trust me, we will work on this. We will fix this together. I need you. I need you here. And really, slowly, we started moving with exercise. We found some stem cell therapy also. But we did everything. We, we, I really looked at everything. I started him exercising, which is key. Key. Movement. Exercise. Key. Then we had to go start figuring out how we're going to do with his teeth. And of course, my wife, originally being from here, was able to plan everything. It was super. Without her, I wouldn't be able to do all this. Finally, for happiness, here are the takeaways. First, figure out where you are. Good, the bad, not good. Figure it out. Exactly. Pinpoint your location so you know where you're starting this journey from. Pursue three things. Enjoyment, not pleasure. That means incorporate people and make memories. Satisfaction, do the hard things. And lastly, meaning of life or ikigai. You need to work on these. The third one, money, fame, status. These are all stops along the way to your destiny. Don't get stuck at a stop. Negative emotions and negative experiences are part of it, but you're gonna have to deal with it. Without those, you will not survive and you will not thrive. Vigorous exercise will lower your unhappiness. How about that one? Know your moral compass and act accordingly. That way you keep yourself in strength and in integrity. You're gonna go off it, but know it so you know how to get back. Incorporate mindfulness meditation, prayer, gratitude, accumulate wisdom. 
These are daily pursuits. Don't fall for the arrival fallacy. And that is, once you've reached your destination, everything will be freaking awesome. The magic is in the journey, every step. And I know everyone says this, and I know it's a cliche, but damn it, it is. The most important things are family. As difficult as they are, deep friendships and fate spirituality. Here are a couple of ending thoughts. Focus less on yourself and more on others. Be in service. Hang out with healthy, happy people and healthy people. Be compassionate, but less empathic. Respect one's unique journey, especially the ones closest to you. Thank you. Join, subscribe, ring the bell notification. Get people to join this journey. It's amazing. And this year is just getting started. Help me grow the channel. Thank you.